Welcome to Globe Watch with me, Charles Sebune. It is a country of roughly 4.7 million citizens. As a member of the European Union, she uses the euro. And near to the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, I'm talking about the Irish Republic, with one of the most intricate relationships with the British monarchy. Today, she is seeking to become a member of the non-permanent seat of the United Nations Security Council. Why is she seeking such a mandate at the time when the post brick exit debate is a key political issue in the economics, the politics, and the socials of their country? My guest today is the Irish government special envoy for the 2021-2022 campaign. Yeah. Ambassador Thompson, welcome to Globe Watch. Thank you very much, Charles. You are moving from one country to another now to seek support, to canvas support from your friendly countries to convince diplomats around the world that you need uh, the non-permanent seat of the United Nations Security Council for the year 2021-2022. Just establish to me why you should be seeking that. Well, I think that for every member state of the United Nations, United Nations all 193 members, the, the very possibility of becoming a member of the Security Council is a reinforcement and recognition of the identity of each member state as a sovereign state. And it, it puts our diplomacy, it will put our diplomacy on a world stage. We have competed for the Security Council roughly once every 20 years and we've always been elected. And this is, is a candidature that was launched as long ago as 2008. It's been a very long campaign and we're comfortable. Uh, we feel that we will be elected and we look forward to a period on the Security Council where we can show the strength, not just of our diplomacy, but of our principles and the values. Oh, you are talking about the principles and values, of course, peace, unity, prevention of conflicts, a multilaterally, more fair, balanced society at the time when um, inequalities are the avalanche. If you have been following the news, you realize that some of America's wealthiest individuals have called for a special tax for the wealthy people. Um, when you were at the United Nations Security Council years back, the context was not the same. How do you evaluate the context in which we are living today where the key pillars of the international system are more of isolationist? Well, I think that certainly the multilateral system is under pressure at the present time. And for that reason, it, it's more important than ever that a country like Ireland that takes a lot of its validity from its membership in the multilateral system is more important than ever that Ireland is, is elected. I think as far as inequality is concerned, Ireland is a country that has uh, deep concerns about inequality in the world. We have, uh, from our own history, we had a long period of colonization. We had a great famine in the 19th century. We are only in the last 20, 30 years, a country that's become wealthy. We, we know poverty, it's, it's very close to, our, to us, and we, for that reason we identify uh, very strongly with countries in Africa that are going through the same stages of development that we went through. Well, your commitment to the world is possibly not questionable, but what will be questioned is possibly how you would tackle some of the key problems facing the world today, climate change, uh, migration, the rise of populism, and we'll be talking brick exit in a moment. How do you foresee to handle such burning issues of divergent views with very opposing ideologies behind that, especially when it comes to a fora like the United Nations system? Well, I think that we have uh, historically the Irish have a talent for looking for compromise. We've shown it on our own island uh, where we reached the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, uh, which was largely putting to rest a conflict that had been dividing Northern Ireland principally, but also dividing much of the island. Well, do you think that compromise is really a word that diplomats can hang on in the world today when the Trump administration says 
um, every nation for itself, God for we all. When people like uh, Boris Johnson, the possibly next British Prime Minister, says that it is UK for itself, when you have people like Matthew Savini in Italy, when you have people like Marie Le Pen, uh, it, it looks quite difficult to reach at a compromise today, right? It's very difficult to reach compromises. I mean, we have known this in the European Union for years, just to hammer out positions on economic issues, on political issues. It all requires a talent of negotiation. And I think Irish diplomats are well up to the task. It's true, the, the environment is not set by Ireland. Ireland's a country with a population of 4.7 million people. It doesn't have that, that political and economic force in the world. It is a relatively small defence force. Ireland principally operates on the basis of looking for solutions, mediation, of putting an emphasis on, on the human relationships in trying to solve all these problems. We certainly, uh, when we are in the Security Council, we re will remain as open uh, to the other members of the General Assembly as we are at the present time. Ireland prides itself on its openness, its humility, its uh, it's not in a position to dictate solutions, but we are in a position to, to ease people into solutions that are in, in conformity with the basic principles of the Charter of the United Nations and of the conventions that flow from it. Well, apart from campaigning worldwide to become a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council in the years to come, one of the other thorniest issues uh, you have to handle as a country is um, break exit. I know that the relationship between um, the Irish Republic and the United Kingdom has been a very strenuous and intricate one from the Irish Revolution, the Irish Republican Army, the War of Independence in 1922, to your proclamation of independence in 1949, when a republic, when you, you, in those days, republics could not be members of the Commonwealth. How much of a hardcore problem is break exit to well, I think Brexit for us uh, was something that we didn't wish. Uh, I don't think anyone envisaged this, including the British Prime Minister at the time. This is a, a situation that we're being forced to wrangle with. It's a very difficult one for us, both in economic terms and also, also uh, in political terms, it, because it certainly upsets things in Northern Ireland. 50% of the population of Northern Ireland voted 54% voted to remain inside the European Union. So here we have a situation where people are being forced uh, and obliged to do things that are against their own wishes. Oh, well, you just said that people um, uh, voted or are being forced to do things which are against their wishes, but this is just one of the uh, willy nillies whether you like it or not, of the entire democratic process where majority decides even to the expense of orders. Um, there is so much talk of the media, by the media of the famous uh, uh, backstore. Uh, just for my ordinary contemporary Cameroonian viewers, one of the issues why the break exit negotiations are extremely complicated and difficult to come to a comprehensive agreement or deal between the UK and the European Union is the back store. What actually is it all about? Well, the backstop was agreed by the British government with the European Union in December of 2017. Basically, it was an insurance policy because at that stage, the British government was convinced that it would be possible for Britain to leave the European Union. Well, I should remind our audience that the Irish Republic is a member of the European Union and this is a free economy the four, practicing the four freedoms, uh, amongst them freedom of movement, and that a return to a physical border between Ireland and its link to the United Kingdom, which is the Northern Ireland will be a terrible assault on the Good, Ivory Agre Good Friday Agreement of 1999. How do you sort out such issues? Well, I think that this issue is being, is being dealt with by the European Union, first and foremost. But the backstop was meant as an insurance policy to make sure that we would we'd never have a situation in Ireland where we returned to a hard border. As a result of agreements that have been reached, the fact that Britain and Ireland 
join the European Union at the same time. We haven't had a customs border in Ireland. 1973, right? For many years. Yep. Yes, we joined at the same time. So we were, in a way, like Sammy's twins, joined at hip when we joined the European Union. Mm. Uh, now we have a much wider range of markets. Britain at one stage was about 60% of our exports, mm. now it's less than 30. But we still depend hugely on the British market, especially what we call indigenous companies, which means Irish companies and not multinationals based in Ireland. And those are the companies in, often involved in the food and drink sector who export very substantially to Ireland. We still, to the UK, we still have a significant uh, agricultural sector, maybe 10% of the economy, but it matters a lot nonetheless. Well, um, you just spoke about the economic implications of uh, break exit to Northern Ireland, um, to Irish Republic. Um, you are daily trade flow with, or your trade flow with the United Kingdom is roughly 13 billion pounds. Um, when you look at such mathematics and some of your best industries, such as the potato industry, everybody knows around the world the Irish potato. Um, you look at the pharmaceuticals, where you are just so excellent, and the brewery industries in particular, companies like Guinness Worldwide, which are indigenous companies, the one you were just talking about. You tell me that the moment brick exit is a success, especially a no deal brick exit, you are completely down, right? No, I'm not saying we're completely down. I think that if there is a no deal exit, there will be partial sectoral agreements reached and they will have to be reached very quickly, but it won't be a comprehensive agreement. So it will still be massively disruptive to the economy. Whatever happens... How much, of, the, how much of a destruction will a no-deal break exit be to the Irish economy? Well, it's impossible to say because it hasn't happened. Um, but it will be a very grave problem for us. Uh, and that's why the Irish government is working very hard to try and avoid, avoid a no-deal Brexit, because for us it would produce uh, catastrophic consequences. Even any kind of Brexit, even a soft Brexit, will provoke problems for Ireland, because the fact is that the European Union, as you said, is based upon the four freedoms, and those freedoms have to be protected, as people like Angela Merkel have repeatedly said. So we cannot allow a situation to arise as the European Union, not just as Ireland, where the United Kingdom uh, has lower health and safety standards than us, where it has, uh, for, for example, allows social dumping, uh, where, where people are paid less, have less labour protections, and therefore can, can compete against the European Union on unequal terms. Those things have been thrashed out in the, the agreements that have been reached, but now we find that the British government is, is, is in finding it extremely difficult to get it through, through Parliament. Apart, apart, apart from the divisions which Brick Exit has already created and a very polarizing British political scene where even members of the same party um, find it very difficult to come to a consensus is the issue of ensuring the political stability in Northern Ireland. And we all know the issue of the Irish Republican Army and the Good Friday Agreement in 1999. How much of a disaster is break exit to the Good Friday Agreement? Well, we don't know, we don't know but uh, it's certainly... You, 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 it this is a country, you are, in, you are in the country with um, think tanks, research groups yes. which conduct this policy yes. analysis and put the material to policy makers. When you look at the various um, research material put at your disposal, are they scaring you? Are they providing material for optimism? Well, I think that the, the general feeling is that the and, and general view of commentators is that the uh, whole question of Brexit will have political repercussions in Northern Ireland. It will raise issues that have been dormant for a number of years. Uh, 
whether whether there will be result in, in a resurgence of do you terrorism see, is not do, do, do you see Catholics and Protestants in France and others coming back as key players after the death of people like Mac McGuinness? Well, I don't think that I don't think that uh, the Brexit cuts along that that particular uh, border between uh. that has existed uh, between the two communities in Northern Ireland. Uh. I think the Brexit divides people and divides families in very different ways. People don't go want to go back to the horrors of the 1970s, 80s, 90s, when when 3,000 people and more than 3,000 people died, uh. Uh, mainly in Northern Ireland, but some in the. You you, you you are a member of the European Union. Um, Twenty-eight member country association awaiting the departure of the British as from September, October thirty-one, this year. Um, the issue from the European Union point of view, including Commission President Jean Claude Juncker, and of course there will be a new Commission leadership and a new parliamentary leadership of the European Union after the last uh, uh, European elections, which of course they will have a new composition uh, at the Commission, the High Representative of Foreign Affairs, Commission President and the European Union Parliament President. The issue is we need a clear message from 10 Downing Street. When you look at the array of those to succeed the I mean, which of them will you think will provide a clear message to British partners, for example, um, the European Union? Is it Boris Johnson, the former um, uh, um, Foreign Secretary, uh, or uh, Jeremy Hunt, the current uh, uh, Foreign Secretary? Or do you see, um, maybe we go to a general election and maybe Labour comes in with Jeremy Corbyn. Is that possible? Which one of them is Ireland comfortable with? Well, I think that I mean, we can't look into a crystal ball. As far as the, the election of a new British Prime Minister, I think obviously this is a campaign, so there's a lot of noise on the wires. It doesn't necessarily represent the views that they will assume uh, once they're elected as Prime Minister. So I think we have to wait and see how this plays out. There have been many twists and turns on this road over the last well, years, maybe at one moment, just like it happened with Theresa May, and you know how the British system works, uh, people don't necessarily elect their prime minister. The party decides and gives you the product you, you want to consume, which is more or less a democratic process uh, to some purists of the democratic realm. And then people will say, well, let's go to a general election. We were just given this by Labour. We were just given this by, by the Conservative Party. Let's show it to the people. And oh, maybe there will be a possibility of a second referendum in which the people will say, look, um, we were misled, like the famous 350 million pounds daily transfer of the NHS funds to the European Union. Is that some of the options that the political witch doctors in uh, Dublin are comfortable with today? No, I don't think we're comfortable in this situation at all because we don't know what's going to happen. It's impossible to predict. There are many options. There have already been many surprises sprung on us as a result of Brexit. Uh, you, 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 you've, used, you've used an expression which um, a majority of British uh, diplomats or European diplomats have used to me. Um, um, we, nobody knows the outcome. Uh, we are yet to understand the environment. But this is a community with some of the best political strategies, communication, politi politics, international relations. I'm quite shocked by the fact that um, such a brilliant community with uh, one of the best educated uh, 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 intellectual class mm -hmm. in the world finds it so difficult to come out with a clear come out policy. Why? Well, I think the European Union has a clear cut, clear cut policy. It's in the agreement. It's been extensively negotiated with the UK over the last few years. The question now is, is a problem that exists within the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom has to make up its mind. And that's what we the problem we've been dealing with all along. The United Kingdom does, has not been able to show that it knows exactly what it wants. It was a, a very simple question in a referendum, but that 
did not presuppose that there'd been extensive thinking on the side of those who were in favor of Brexit. It appears that never transpired, that never happened. So here we are dealing with a, a, the fact that the British political system has not been able to deliver what it promised to its own population. But as far as the union's concerned, we have uh, all, all signed up to this particular agreement. It's not, we're not going to change the agreement. Uh, the existing, perhaps there may be changes in, in, in relation to the political direct declaration about the future relationship, but the terms of the actual separation have been agreed. Unfortunately, Theresa May could not get her parliament and her party to back her. Well, while we give the British the time to reflect and come out with a suitable outcome for this Siamese relationship they have established with the European Union to ensure that the children are separated, all of them alive. Let's talk about Irish Republic. Uh, you have roughly four Nobel Prizes in literature. You are one of the best countries in the world when it comes to the production of poets. You are country's history, one of the most charming in roughly 28 years. You have constructed an extraordinary economic success model, just like Estonia. How did you do that? Well, I think it wasn't a straight line, because even after independence from Britain in 1922, uh, Ireland went through a whole period of autarky, where we tried to provide for ourselves by uh, local production of all the basic necessities that we needed. Uh, that period ended in the 1960s because it, it didn't work. We had had large, large scale emigration continuing from Ireland in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And uh, basically what Ireland started doing was to encourage foreign investment in, from multilateral, multinational corporations, uh, particularly from the United States, Germany, Britain, and, and Japan. And those, uh, those particular investments helped turn the Irish economy around. It was all facilitated by the fact in 1973 we joined the European Union. So barriers over time came down for Irish exports to the rest of the European Union. The country itself, which had been very inward turned, uh, very obsessed with itself, uh, started to look at the world in different terms. Uh, the, the number of people who came to Ireland to work uh, escalated very strongly. Now something like 18% of the population of the Republic of Ireland were, was born outside the Republic itself. So the European Union has given us confidence to, to not just be trapped... The, question I'm, the, the reason I'm putting that question to you is that your Republic is declared at the time of great political turbulence in Europe, 1949. The British Empire is collapsing worldwide. The shackles and shambles of World War II were widespread. Misery, poverty, and the destruction of the entire industrial scale during the terrible period, 1939 to 1945. You look like a Japanese miracle, and I doubt you ever received the Marshall Plan 8. 2008 economic recession comes in hits and you are affected. A few years after you sail out, Greece is still in the rubble. Explain to me such metamorphosis of always resilience coming out strong. I think resilience is, is uh, part of the, the Irish character. Sure. Because the Irish have gone through, okay. through so many hard times. <laughs> so we, we tend to bounce back. Oh. Uh, but it's true that we went... Uh, through a very harsh period mm. after the crisis in 2008 mm. of austerity, mm. when budgets were cut, salaries were cut mm. or frozen, uh, when, when people really, really suffered. But thanks to all the relationships we built over the years uh, during our time in the European Union, the fact that we now have an economy that's export-led, the Irish, the Irish have been able to, to overcome it. We still have a debt. Well, the, fifth, the, the fifth volume of British exports uh, to Ireland, yes. right? It's a, yeah, go ahead. Well, we're, we're very important to Britain as well. I think we're the sixth largest importer of British, uh, British exports, so mm -hmm. we're important to them as well. Uh, it's, a very, it's a very strong relationship. It's a relationship which is still going to exist in diff on different terms 
from what it has in the past. But certainly Ireland has shown itself to be extremely active in terms of attracting foreign investment of the best companies. Many of the top uh, IT companies, the pharmaceutical companies, have their base in Ireland, some massive uh, factories like Intel with 5,000 employees. We have uh, now a reputation in our own right and a reputation because these large foreign companies have spawned subsets of Irish companies, clusters of Irish companies that work around them. And uh, Ireland has, has acquired quite a reputation as a country closely associated with innovation and with high tech. Uh, Kofi Annan uh, said on one occasion that some people come when the television cameras are, are rolling and then when they leave, when the, they leave the people leave. The Irish always stay. The Irish are always there to help the United Nations. That's the attitude we bring to this campaign. The Irish government envoy for the 2021-2022 non-permanent membership of the United Nations Security Council, Ambassador Kenneth Thompson, thank you very much indeed for being guest on Global Watch. Thank you very much for inviting me. You are welcome. Thank you. Charles.